now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. A lot of these people that have all these abilities, who have celestial star ancestry, they're operating not only throughout this cosmos, but in higher planes, and they're working against the Draco Empire. The photonic energy and the cosmic rays will activate our higher centers. And it's incumbent upon us to ride that frequency wave. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you are listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, our very special guest is Mike Patterson. Mike Patterson has the YouTube channel Sasquatch Ontario. Mike Patterson grew up in Ontario, Canada, and at the age of 12, had his first Sasquatch sighting while walking alone down a country back road. That moment would have an impact unknown at the time, as he grew up spending much time in the forests of Ontario, land of a quarter million freshwater lakes. A wildlife nature photographer in his spare time, it was only natural that he progressed to an epiphany of searching for the elusive forest giants that have been the talk around many campfires. His first close vocal encounter in October of 2008 would change his life in a single moment of knowing. He would then spend the next eight years pursuing and documenting Sasquatch activity in multiple locations where Sasquatch was said to frequent. It was in 2012 that he was invited onto a private property in the Kawartha Lakes region of Ontario, Canada, where suspected Sasquatch activity was said to be happening. After four years of previous experience and knowing what evidence to look for, Mike learned quickly that there was indeed Sasquatch present at this location. He then spent the next two and a half years making as many visits as permitted to document and, and progress a situation of Sasquatch contact that has become the most controversial case for Sasquatch interaction to date. Mike has documented contact to a degree of direct verbal communication as well as bringing a plethora of evidence to the table that has given a whole new perspective into the world of the Sasquatch. Once thought to be nothing more than a flesh and blood bipedal ape, new evidence has been brought to light that shows we're dealing with a highly intelligent, likely ancient people who show abilities that defy the current scientific paradigm. Mike continues his research to date with ongoing visits at his personal location, as well as helping others make similar contact through his method of approach. His knowledge on Sasquatch behavior and insight into the elusive world is paramount to the subject at hand. So without any further ado, Mike Patterson, how are you? I'm good, James. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. I, I'm uh, happy to be here. My pleasure, Mike. This is an epic event as far as I'm concerned, because... With your insight and your personal experiences with Sasquatch, we gain valuable insight into an entirely different culture. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, how did your involvement start in the subject of Sasquatch? What events led up to your initial encounter? It was uh, back in 2000. Well, it was, it, it was back when I was 12, actually, I, you know, that I believe I had my first sighting. I'd been... I'd been doing some fishing. My my family was staying at a, a chalet for the weekend uh, up in northern Ontario, and my my dad had taken me up the road a little bit. Might have been a half a mile up the road or something. I I can't remember. It wasn't that far because he dropped me off, you know, by myself kind of thing, do some fishing. And uh, there was a there was, I remember there was some people uh, campground there around the river, and uh, dusk started setting in, so I. I um, started heading back, and it may, it might have been about 50 yards ahead of me up the road. There was something standing at the side of the road. Uh, it, it was huge, and it turned. When it saw me, it turned uh, and walked into the bush, and I know it wasn't a bear. And it was, uh, I turned around. I was, I was, you know, I was terrified, so I ran back to this campground. And I still remember I walked up to this uh, this family sitting around this campfire, and I could still see the look on their faces as uh, 
Um, I was white as a ghost. I couldn't even talk. My mouth was pouted. I couldn't. I couldn't get any words out. And I, you know, I, that went on for a little bit. I finally managed to, you know, ask for some help. Right. And I remember one of the, the gentlemen sitting there. He gave me a ride back. And I remember I pointed out. Uh, and I said that I got chased by a bear at that time. You know, I'm just a kid kind of thing, right? So I didn't know what happened. And it wasn't uh, until 2008 that uh, I, again, got involved in this subject. Um, I'd been spending some time in the in the woods uh, by myself on my time off uh, with a camera, chasing wildlife, you know, uh, doing some wildlife photography. And I have a real passion for that. So in my downtime, you know, I'd always be out in the woods, usually alone. Or I'd have my significant other at the time with me. Uh, you know, she'd be with me sometimes, but uh, for the most part, she'd be working on the weekends. So, you know, I'd be off into the woods kind of thing. And one day I had a, an epiphany. And I just... Uh, you know, I had this thought that uh, of looking into this this whole subject of Sasquatch. You know, I had had a car and I had the gear and spending all this time in the woods. You know, just kind of come out of nowhere and I started looking into that. And it was uh, wasn't long after that I went camping. Um, I'd been working. Uh, my employer at the time had a cottage on this lake up north up in the Bon Echo region, uh, Bon Echo Provincial Park region, up, uh, it's, I guess it'd be a few hours east of, northeast of Toronto. I'm living with a buddy of mine right now, and it was actually him that I went camping with that time. And that was the very first time I went out, so we were, uh, we had this camp spot on the far side of the lake, and it's just bush there. One side had cottages, the other side is just nothing but bush. I think it was about 8 o'clock in the morning, the next morning after uh, our first night. And uh, we heard this screaming going off in the bush. And I was, uh, you know, I'd never heard anything like it. You know, I'm pretty sure it was a Sasquatch. Um, I've heard similar calls since, you know, I, I've looked into it since kind of thing. And that was the very first time, but uh, I started, you know, doing more more research into this. And... I'd end up, I made a comment on a video one day, and some guy ended up contacting me and asked if I wanted to go into a location of uh, previous activity. I, I didn't know this person, never met him in my life. His name uh, was Mike as well. And it was about, uh, you know, I talked to him a little bit uh, online there, and, and things uh didn't happen for roughly about a month and then he contacted me again he said well, you want to go and i said okay well let's do it this weekend then and uh we used uh, google earth he showed me a spot on on there where we would meet so i met up met up with him about uh, uh it was about noon on it was october 25th 2008 drizzly kind of day and we went into this uh, this one area, and I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't really have any experience at this point. So he was kind of showing me the ropes, and I don't know if this is beginner's luck, but uh, personally I don't think so because of the way things have unfolded. But uh, it was four and a half hours later, I heard a giant guttural uh, whoop uh, three times, and it was very close, and it filled the forest. And um, I remember at the time thinking, you know, it sounded so pronounced, it sounded like it could speak English. And it was it was so raspy and it was just a huge, massive sound. And when I heard that, I knew right then and there that Sasquatch did exist. And that was, um, we'd sat down on the ground there and just kind of um, to see if anything else would happen. Uh, no, nothing did. Um, there was a, there was a instance just immediately prior to that where I'd heard some it sounded like a, a chest thump triple chest thump from like a gorilla kind of thing that that was the tone it was and I, I you know I knew that I knew the sounds of the forest that this was odd it was really odd so that's when I I'd stopped my buddy when we were walking and and this happened just immediately before the the whoops from the other 
the other Sasquatch because there was that we got approached from two sides, and it was that that moment here in that call that you know changed my life and put me on the course that I'm on today. I was in denial for about two weeks, even though when when that happened, I knew I knew instantly that uh, you know what it was. It's just no denial when you hear a Sasquatch speak uh, at close range like that. It took me about two weeks to you know let play that in my my mind constantly uh, you know it just doesn't turn off and it actually it hasn't turned off since you know once you dive down that rabbit hole it's been uh, I'm in my ninth year now and it's daily it's all day long right this it, it really kind of takes over your life uh, when you're at a level of uh, communication and interaction that I've been able to be- develop things to but uh, so that's kind of how it all started as these contacts developed over time, uh, you're an experienced woodsman. You know what the sounds of the forest are like. And aside from footsteps, something large moving through the bush, after a while, did you begin to, in a sense, become attuned to them? Like, even without having to hear any sounds or birds scattering or anything, were you, after a while, able to sense their approach? Did you feel them kind of tuning into you after a while? Sometimes... When they're around, especially at this point, they they basically let me know. I can't, you know, I don't always sense when they're around, but they'll let me know with uh, stick breaks or there's other phenomena that happens. Uh, they they uh, they're very good at what they do. At, you know, I, if they want you to know they're there, uh, a lot of their activity is it can be really subtle or it can be extremely blatant and everything in between kind of thing, right? I tend to go into areas that, uh, you know, I know they're there. So it comes down to whether or not they want to allow, let me know that they're close by or or not. I don't always sense that. Uh, The activity going on around me at this point, it seems to me that they're keeping a close watch on me, to to put it mildly. (laughs) Well, they they must have their own vetting process, if you will, where they've checked you out after all this time. I'm sure we give off a unique, distinctive scent to them. We, I'm sure we give off a unique vibe. So maybe they've decided you've, you've passed muster over all this time. When I got involved in this um, situation that, uh, that we'll get into uh, that was up north um, after four years of being involved in the subject, you know, I, ha- I, I had this situation just dropped into my lap kind of thing and there's some strangeness that surrounds how all this came to be kind of thing uh you know it's only been recently in the in the last little while that i've been kind of connecting the dots throughout my entire life really and i've I've had paranormal things going on since i was in the crib periodically throughout my life you know my life saved a couple of times uh, through instances where I was definitely uh, sure sure to die, and there's been some intervention happen. Um, so I think that uh, they know your heart. They know your intent. They have this... Uh, they've shown me their higher consciousness than we are. You know, they, they have a higher developed consciousness. This is what we're dealing with. You know, science doesn't go there. In my opinion, science is really lame on this subject. They're just kind of dragging their ass and avoiding uh, certain aspects, which I'll I'll also get into later. But uh, as far as the Sasquatch go, uh, as far as betting people, you know, they they seem to know our hearts and our intent, and and it seems to me that they're they're reaching out to us to humanity and trying to wake us up kind of thing you know uh, i see we're in the midst of a, a paradigm shift a shift in consciousness for humanity and it's it seems to be uh, unfolding as they choose to unveil their you know their existence in my opinion this isn't a discovery by science because they are written throughout history and they they've been known for a very long time this is more of a reveal by the Sasquatch themselves. So, I, um, as far as uh, science goes, uh, I don't. I don't think they'll be doing any discovering anytime soon. It's just kind of the same old 
um, going in circles, putting up trail cams and banging on trees and showing footprints and, you know, circumstantial evidence that uh, that never really proves anything. But uh, the, the Sasquatch themselves seem to be the ones that are, are going to show and reveal themselves, you know, over time as they fee- see fit. And I see a a pattern in how they're doing it. It seems to me to be uh, in a similar way that uh, their behavior works with each of us that they reach out to and they give information and knowledge and progression in in understanding um, in baby steps. And this is constant with uh, myself and others that I help. You know, I have one lady local uh, a good friend of mine who I've been mentoring, and she's been at it for, I guess, about a year and a half since I started showing her, you know, how to make contact. And it's happening exactly as I've told her it would, and as well as others that I've spoken to, you know, that the activity um, it unfolds in a way as the Sasquatch like I said, you know, giving these little baby steps. It's not much, and they can they give a lot of information with the small gestures. You know, I think they, uh, it, it seems to be uh, almost uh, methodical in their approach. And it seems that this is what they're also doing on their reveal uh, to humanity kind of thing. Um, I just talked to another guy the other day from New York who just uh, recently had a, uh, he had his, uh, world flipped upside down with an incident that happened to him and he was he was totally in the, the flesh and blood camp and he was sitting up in a tree stand he's a hunter and he uh, he had a, a sighting on on a Sasquatch I think he mentioned uh, came as close as about 20 yards where he's almost looking down on top of it and it ended up, uh, it was it was almost dark in that, but he still had a good sighting on it. And it took one step, and on the second step, it disappeared into a flash of blue light. And that's it. And he was, uh, you know, that blew his mind and just, it, it flips your whole paradigm. It's funny, while he's telling his story, there's something thrown towards him in the room that, you know, he, he didn't put two and two together until after the fact when, uh, you know, people started pointing that out. And that's something that a Sasquatch would do. There's an aspect going on here where, uh, you know, the people have a sighting and they, you know, they, they assume they're, they're just flesh and blood. And if you try to tell them there's something else going on here, that they have all these abilities, it's it's hard for a lot of people to digest because, you know, all they've had is a visual or a sighting kind of thing, and they don't know what's really going on. But when you start getting involved and, and activity starts happening around you and it's constant and, you, you know, and they start showing you their abilities, you see there's much more going on with this species than, than uh, is really being told about through you know programs on television or science and or whatever it's uh, you know they all tend to avoid the the paranormal aspect if you want to call it that when you know in my opinion it, the paranormal is entirely natural it's just uh, a lack of education on on understanding the bigger picture going on around us. Yes, I would agree, and I'm glad that Hunter saw the metaphysical side of Sasquatch. I mean, he can't deny what he saw, and now he can begin to understand what indigenous peoples the world over have known about Sasquatch, that there is indeed a metaphysical, interdimensional aspect to Sasquatch. There definitely is, and, you know, a lot of people avoid this. I went to the the Sasquatch Summit in Washington this past, uh, it was mid-November there. I got invited down by, by Johnny Manson, Super guy, he's the guy who hosts this, and really good event. Um, there's a couple of uh, speakers there. Tom Powell was one, and Tom's really the only science mind in this subject who's who's open minded and and knows what's going on to a certain degree. Um, other others like you know Jeff Meldrum and that they're basically you know stuck inside this little box and and they're not uh, really not going anywhere with it. But eventually, 
and, and like I said, so I, I believe through the reveal of the Sasquatch themselves, it's going to get to a point where it's just completely undeniable, and and we're going to have to, uh, you know, take a look at things a lot more closely and what's really going on. You know, science can only avoid this paranormal aspect for so long. I see the same difficulties uh, scientifically orientated people have uh, regards the extraterrestrial UFO phenomenon. They keep trying to cram their understanding, their their concept of science into what amounts to uh, a round hole, a square peg into a round hole, and it just won't work because the high strangeness factor manifests again and again and again in, in UFO cases. And they would much rather stick to lights in the sky, much rather stick to radar sightings, pilot sightings, something that is still at arm's length, but you really can't sink your teeth into that something, because it's too confronting, Mike, uh, because if one has to accept the fact that Sasquatch, in our example, has this metaphysical capability, and he's teaching us and he's showing us all of these things, it begs the question, what relationship is there a symbiotic relationship between us and Sasquatch that we have been systematically dumbed down and made to forget about? I believe so, and I, I believe there is a symbiotic relationship with everything. We, uh, y you know, like as far as the current paradigm is concerned, our consciousness is confined to the individual, um, which is just absolutely ridiculous in my mind, but with uh, programs like... Uh, even the CIA's own own uh, remote viewing program, which went on for two decades, uh, uh, you know, shows there's that that consciousness is, uh, you know, it, it's not confined to to a single individual kind of thing. There's there's a connection um, to, to everything. Sasquatch are trying to show us that you know we are all connected, like they are. I believe them to be a, an older race of people an ancient people who uh, evolved down a different path, a, a natural path, without any uh, interference of of being dumbed down like we have. Um, there's, you know, there's been a stigma created around their their existence as as well as the whole UFO thing. And it's funny when you or ET thing. It, it's funny when you ask people if they believe in either of those subjects, and you watch their reaction, and it just shows the stigma that has been put on those subjects to, in my opinion, to, you know, to keep us at bay from, from learning this truth. And I, and I think there are forces in effect that are trying to, uh, you know, drag this out as long as they can and, and keep this information from us. Because, one, you know, once this knowledge comes out and, and there's a shift in consciousness, which is already in the works, it breaks this system down, you know, this the confines of religion, science, and, and politics, and the, the control methods and all that, it's going to, you know, it's all going to fall apart eventually when truth is exposed. And this this is why I'm involved in this subject. Um, I see a lot of people, you know, their motives are money, their motives are whatever, you know, trying to get on television, this and that. Uh, their motives aren't proper, and they're not getting anything either. They're not really pulling in any, any good evidence Myself, you know, I'm I'm doing my best to, you know, just keep the ego in check and and do this for the the the, the right reasons, you know, to bring this truth out to humanity and and this is about healing the earth and and humanity itself, and, you know, and expanding the collective consciousness because, uh, you know, if this doesn't happen, we're basically all screwed, right? You know, everybody knows just looking at the way the planet's going you know we're in big trouble here so sasquatch from what you described seems to be bringing people into the picture to a greater understanding and awareness of their surroundings almost in a shamanic initiatory sense uh, baby steps showing people things bit by bit and allowing the people's own sensibility allowing the people's own intuition to gain a better understanding about all this. Now, you alluded earlier to an ongoing situation in Ontario. You've been involved in something going on over there for some time. What's been going on there in the recent past? It was uh, after four years of uh, being involved in the subject, 
frequenting uh, several areas uh, in Ontario and, and gaining some insight and, and experience uh, through some interactions in, in multiple locations, kind of learning, learning the ropes at that time, still not understanding or having any insight into, uh, into their uh, super abilities, if you want to call it that. I, I still didn't know, have any clue what I was dealing with kind of thing, right? And I'd gotten a call. Uh, the the guy that I was uh, going out with for the, the, the most part, I'd spent about five years off, off and on. You know, periodically we'd, we'd contact each other and uh, head off into the, the woods somewhere for a weekend kind of thing. And uh, he put out some videos and stuff and structures, and uh, he got he got contacted at one point and he calls me up and and said that uh somebody uh, contacted him about activity happening on their uh, family property up in the Kawartha Lakes region up in Ontario and it was when he told me that you know something I don't know something kind of went off inside me and I just had a knowing that this was this was what I was looking for I'd spent 4 years you know, dealing with this already, and it is kind of a profound knowing. And I've had this this strange uh, understanding throughout my life that something was coming. You know, I, I don't tend to speak about that much publicly, but I guess uh, this is really the first time I, I've I've said that publicly. I've you know I've talked about it in. Uh, groups and Facebook and stuff and all that kind of thing, but um, I've had something in my entire existence, you know, tell me something was coming in, and when this situation happened, I didn't know that this was it, I hadn't, you know, connected all the dots yet, but I did know I had a profound understanding that this was what I was waiting for as far as the Sasquatch activity was concerned, so I, I told my my friend at the time, I said, give me that information. I want that interview. And I, I was very adamant about getting that information from him. Getting, you know, so he ended up talking to the people and, and, and saying, uh, you know, he has a friend, myself, uh, Mike, that uh, would like to interview them. And they were okay with it. So I ended up visiting them at their home. And uh, we sat down, and they told me uh, some of the stuff that was going on in the property. It was uh, it was their parents. It was the guy's parents' uh, cottage, and the, the, they'd suspected for about five years that there was activity going on. Um, but it was the final incident that caused him to reach out. Was uh, his father was laying in bed uh, one morning. He sat up, and there's big window right there looking out. The, the tree, there's a small single lane gravel road right out front there and then the tree line starts and it goes up on an incline and he sat up in bed and he saw I guess he was probably just under eight feet tall uh, Sasquatch standing right there outside the window uh, had his back to him and Bill was uh, he's a he's an older gentleman he's no longer with us um, God bless his soul he, he's a super guy really you know, I, I got along well with, with him. So he, he got up and he went and did his business um, in the bathroom. He comes back and and it was, you know, the Sasquatch was gone kind of thing. But that incident was basically the the moment that he really, uh, his son reached out and I ended up going and speaking to him and his girlfriend who told me some of the things that had happened throughout the years and that you know and I kind of knew what questions to ask so started putting two and two together kind of thing that well uh, one of the neighboring cottages one day there was a um, so they had a cake on the counter inside the cottage and one of them one of the the people come in the cottage to see a, a bear running out the door with the cake and there was another incident where uh, his family was sitting around campfire outside the cottage. And there's a, a shed there. The other son had gone around the side of the shed to relieve himself. And he come running out saying there was a bear 
back behind the shed, which you know the the proximity is is right there basically, and th- that's not how bears act. They you know they they're not going to hang around. There there was no food right there, or anything right. So um, they were being watched basically, and a lot of people I find they do that. You know they they don't. Uh, your mind doesn't compute what you're looking at, so you tend to say bear, and, and I think that happens a lot. You know, even happened with myself way back. So, so you know, these little incidents, they started explaining these things to me, and I'm asking, you know, well, any other strange things going on, kind of thing, throughout the years, and and a lot of them just started pointing towards uh, activity. So it was the very first night. Um, I recorded every night on audio from day one, and I'd spent about, uh, so I started in the latter part, it was September 2012, and I, it was about 80, rough, roughly 80 visits over a two and a half year period. The first year, we were basically in there every weekend. His father uh, gave me permission at first to camp on the land at my, you know, at my leisure kind of thing. But that didn't last too long before his son, you know, he wanted some, he wanted involvement, right? And basically wanted to control my visits. So I had to uh, kind of wait for, um, you know, him to give the go-ahead. And, you know, but I, but I was happy to have that because uh, during the winter time, especially because, uh, you know, I was able to have a nice warm cottage to go in and out of for documenting uh, activity. And uh, I spent three full winters uh, documenting uh, footprints and all sorts of other stuff there. And it was, uh, you know, it was the snow that really told a a story, you know. Because when you start seeing footprints and trackways and 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 it's a clean blanket of snow everywhere, you know, there's no, no people have been around or... In the there are cottages, uh, other cottages around that area, but uh, most of them shut down for the winter. There are a few people that live up there, but as far as the the rest goes, it, it's pretty quiet. So, you know, you, you start seeing uh, prints and trackways, and they just appear suddenly and and stop suddenly, and you know, made no sense kind of thing, right? So. Anyways, I'm kind of uh, jumping ahead here, but uh, so it was my first visit, and um, this was September, and I'd set up my tent, and I went to sleep in my tent that night, and I, I put audio recorder uh, just outside, and, and I had a, a pair of omnidirectional microphones, uh, extension mics clipped into that. I was using a Zoom H2 recorder, um, recording it. Uh, 320 kilobytes per second, uh, highest bit rate for MP, MP3 kind of thing. Uh, I, I find a lot of people in, involved in this subject too tend to use some crappy gear, right? So the the audio recordings I have, you know, I was happy to to record at a good quality kind of thing. Um, I had this audio set up right outside my tent. These little little microphones had clips on them, so I clipped them to branches, uh, you know, just a couple feet off the ground, and uh, when I went and climbed in my tent that first night, um, I had that uh, other mic guy with me, but he was staying in his vehicle. It was it was a little chilly that night, so he come up. Uh, we we're up this incline. I guess it goes up about uh, I don't know 100 feet plus, maybe 150 feet, and then it levels off. And my tent was kind of tucked back a bit, um, so he come walking up about. Uh, one o'clock in the morning with me up to the tent because I, I was pretty freaked out still. You know, I, I I had a lot of fear. I didn't know what I was dealing with, right? So I'm like, <laughs> come walking up to the tent with me. So he, he does, and uh, once I get up there, I get in my tent, and get all you know comfortable in that, and he's heading back down the hill towards his car. And he, and when he gets to the bottom, he fires up his car. When he's inside, windows are rolled up because he wanted to, you know, turn the heater on, and get some heat going, right? And uh, in that time, as he's walking down, when you play the audio back, there's a there was a good tree limb right by the audio uh, by the microphones that got snapped off, 
and you can hear the big crack as it snapped. And that thing should have hit the ground and made a huge sound, but it doesn't. You barely, barely hear it touch the ground because there's a pair of hands holding it. And it was shortly after that that uh, you hear this uh, it's almost fox-like chatter start up. It's right outside my tent wall. And, you know, I'm kind of freaking out, but I'm, I'm quiet about it, right? My heart's pounding. It's like, what the hell is going on here kind of thing. I didn't hear the, the big tree limb snap. Maybe I was rustling in my sleeping bag trying to get comfortable. I don't know. And, and then once that chatter stopped, uh, there was a little break. You hear a couple of stick snaps, I think, as there's uh, maybe a couple of footsteps taken. It was a younger juvenile, too, right? And then all of a sudden, this perfectly mimicked barred owl call happens, uh, this scream. and But it, it came from the, the forest floor right outside my tent wall, not up in the trees kind of thing. And uh, so that basically scared the hell out of me. And it was the next day I found a pile of scat, human-looking scat, you know, that would have come from a juvenile. And um, I ended up sending that into Melba Ketchum, who did some tests on it. But uh, scat is basically the worst thing to try and pull DNA from. So she never ended up uh, getting any uh, any DNA from that. And, that, you know, so at, at first this was my involvement of... of you know, trying to uh, document and photograph them, and and um, you know, I'm putting up trail cams and that. And, but things changed over time. There was a uh, another time where it was the the owner and his son and myself were there, and we're sitting. And this was near the beginning too. And I'd set my my tent up in the forest, and uh, I'm, I can't remember what time it was. And so I left the cottage, told them, okay, I'm going to go down to the, you know, crawl into my tent. And I'm walking down this little gravel road. I'm about to veer into the forest towards, uh, you know, roughly where my tent is. And there was a, a, a bright, I, I had this little LED flashlight, so I couldn't really see very well. You know, it, it barely looked into the forest. And my tent was in there a bit, so it had nothing to do with, with my flashlight. And... I look into the forest, and there's this, it looked like a big eye staring back at me, orange. And it was just one, so I think it was peeking out from behind the tree. But it was lit up like it had a, a light turned on it, you know, inside its head kind of thing. And that freaked me out. I'd never seen that in my life. I, you know, I've heard about this. And it, it was nothing like eye shine, like, you you know, you would see the reflection of a cat or something, or, or an owl's eyes. Or, it was... Uh, it was very bright and, you know, really distinct. And I ended up, I just kind of chuckled nervously and turned around and went back to the cottage and ended up crashing on the couch for the night. So those were the first uh, couple times uh, spending some time in a, in a tent there. You know, bef this is before really getting a grasp of what was going on. But that, that was my initial uh, moments there. And... Uh, and even the very first night, I managed to capture, uh, aside from the, the vocals that I described with the mimicked barred owl and all that, it was right, you know, from day one, they were giving vocals. But, uh, you know, it started off kind of slow, right? But that really progressed where it got just uh, insane after about eight months of, of continued activity. The vocalizations are of incredible clarity. And there seems to be a range of vocalizations. Some of them are like the really loud, screechy ones, and, and others almost have a whale song kind of sing-song quality to it. Have you determined any kind of language pattern uh, from the Sasquatch? I've definitely recorded some language from them. I've recorded direct verbal communication. I've recorded vocals from multiple um, individuals of the same family. Uh, as well as their footprints, handprints. Um, I pulled hair from fresh prints and snow that were, you know, minutes old, if that. I've captured roars that... Um, there's a small bay there, a small bay of water, 
you know, a lot of people wonder why there's so much reverb in that. You know, this is, uh, if they knew what the Korthas were like, you know, this, Ontario alone has, we, we have a third of the entire globe's fresh water here. There's a quarter million lakes in this province. So there's, uh, there was a small body of water there. And I've even, uh, I remember one night it was, uh, there was a um, meteor shower going on. This was uh, December 2012, and there was two Sasquatch roaring back and forth, one way off in the distance and then one down the end of the bay. And the one down the end of the bay, there, at one point I, I started to walk, uh, you know, try to get a little closer. And I took a few steps and I turned around and I said, screw that, because it, it was extremely intimidating. But those roars, there was about an inch to two inches of ice on the, on the bay at the time, and he was snapping the ice with his roar, like mid-roar, that you would hear the ice just snap, and it was just absolutely incredibly powerful. The one that I had most of the vocalizations from, at one point he gave me his name, because uh, I spent months patting my chest, because I knew he was right there. The, the activity going on was just, you know, it was, it was phenomenal. It was from day one, and it never stopped. It was every visit, throughout the visit, and it, it just basically progressed throughout the entire time I spent there. So I, I would spend time patting my chest and saying my name and giving the other guy's name. And uh, it was finally one night, uh, or one morning, playing the audio back on the drive back. Uh, I heard him say uh, say my name and and the other guy's name, and then he said Nefetia. So he finally gave us his name. And he actually even stated uh, Anastasia as his little sister's name. And he, he actually even says sister. So, But as far as the language goes, I've, I've captured other pieces um, of, of clear vocals, you know, like one where he says Ninadadwa. Ninadadwa. If that's not a word, I don't know what it is. Uh, another another thing, uh, I, I asked him a question of something that I'd heard him previously say. I think I actually sent you that this file. I asked him a question. He gives me an instant response. And it's very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just, it, it just sounds like ancient language to me. You know, it's it's extremely, uh, the, the timing, you know, is, it was impeccable, just his response time kind of thing. And there's been, there's been other uh, captures where there, it sounds like there's some Asian dialect in there where I've caught a couple of them talking to each other. You know, they're messing around with the, I, I would run... I would run one audio recorder, usually uh, through the sunroof of my vehicle, through my car, and I'd put my audio recorder on my seat, and I'd run these extension mics through the car and put a windsock over top, and and they would gravitate to my audio recorders always. They always did that, and he'd he'd come out to my car, be banging on my hood and putting tree limbs on top of my car and, and talking away and he's right there so you know as far as the clarity goes it's it's unprecedented there are an extreme amount of excellent vocalizations throughout uh, I got roughly about 60 videos on my channel and and they're they're on there consecutively so it's uh, as the situation unfolded that's how the videos were posted kind of thing so that there is a lot of audio to you know if people listen to those videos and go through them there there's some great vocal captures and our listeners can go to the youtube channel sasquatch ontario which is mike patterson's dedicated youtube channel one thing i've noticed also is the mimicry because certain certain other beings let's say can also mimic they can mimic children's voices they can mimic uh, sounds in the forest they can even mimic insects uh, have you experienced this besides the owl that was that must have been freaky the the owl at ground level screeching like that 
Yeah, yeah, that one was, uh, well, first it was kind of a fox-like chatter, and then it was an owl, you know, uh, within a couple minutes. So there's a couple of uh, different vocals there. But there's been some pretty strange stuff. Uh, there was one incident where we pulled up on a snowmobile up to this one, one spot down the road, uh, shut it off. There's no other snowmobilers in the area at the time. You know, there's no engines running anywhere. And all of a sudden... We're sitting, you know, we're standing there, and we hear two revs from a snowmobile engine with no motor running close by, and that was really strange. There was nobody there; it was just us. So, there's been, uh, yeah, I, I've, you know, I've heard of other vocals that they've done to that have been, you know, laughable. You know, trying to uh, do a lousy wolf mimic or. Or, a, or an owl, and I'm, I'm going back and forth with them, you know, kind of thing. And, and I know it's them, right? So they, they do uh, try to pull off other animals of the forest. And, that well, they do uh, an excellent job with them sometimes, too. But sometimes, you know, it's uh, it can be everything and anything with these guys. You never know. They always uh, catch you off guard kind of thing, and they're very good at what they do. One thing I wanted to ask also was the Kawartha Lakes region Sasquatch. Was that a different tribe from the Sasquatch group you first had interactions with when you first got into the research and investigations? And do you feel that there are different tribes and is there tribal interaction like we observe with the Native Americans or the Aboriginals, uh, let's say? From my experience and what I'm seeing, and I, I'm not going to get into the proximity or, or um, how many, how much uh, activity I'm seeing, because I don't, <laughs> I don't like to give too much of that information away. Uh, you know, as, as far as the proximity to us goes, the, there are uh, Sasquatch basically everywhere. I'll say that. You know, I, I didn't, uh, when I first got involved in this, you know, science is sitting there saying, well, uh, you know, there might be small groups in remote mountainous regions. And from my first encounter, I knew that was, you know, a pile of, you know, what I had that happen uh, close to the city kind of thing. So I knew there was uh, something else going on that science wasn't letting on about. Or the group that I was involved with in the Korth is, was different from, um, the the first uh, ones where I, I heard those vocals, and I've run into other groups in <clears throat> in multiple locations. So they are widely spread, and I believe there is there is a lot of them, because uh, especially with the number of children I'm witnessing, you know, the prints I'm seeing, and you know, there's been some strange incidents that that go on with them that have shown their their abilities and the prints with uh, I've documented numerous prints from uh, multiple individuals in that one location up in the Kawartha it actually started off with uh, in October with an awesome print find in a swamp where there was uh, there was I, I can't remember there, there might have been a half a dozen different individuals I didn't really go counting how many I was dealing with I just you know I wasn't I wasn't in this to prove their existence or anything i you know this, this was started off as a personal journey and i, I just kind of it, it unfolded as it did you know and i just started putting the stuff out there whatever i was doing um, but they they did have quite a few uh, young family members and the one nefetia seemed to always have his little sister with them I've captured her voice a couple times uh, you know real cute little voice on her not not speaking words, but uh, uh, actually that that's not true because I, there is a couple of pieces where there's uh, it might be her, it might not. Uh, these uh, just just little words spoken. Um, actually, there's one piece of audio that I think I sent you there to to play uh, later on, where there's two voices speaking at the same time. One's an older male, and I believe one is a young daughter.
or young female, little 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 kid. I've recorded the vocals from an infant too, you know, and 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 I've been able to to distinguish uh, a, a couple of differences in the males. Like uh, Nefertia has a lisp; he can't pronounce his s's properly. And then I have a piece of audio where you can hear. I believe it's his older brother who has a 17-inch footprint, and he he actually says Sasquatch says yeah. You know, he gives this a uh, funny. Um, vocalization where he, he actually says Sasquatch. So they're, I've noticed with them they have a lot of humor, which, you know, I would think would come with a, a higher consciousness. And they show this humor a lot in their interactions. It's constant. You know, they're intimidating at times. Um, their, their activity is boisterous. You know, the, their, their behavior is big, just like they are, right? And I think a lot of people misconstrue that, too. Um, some of their behavior, thinking they're being attacked if they got a rock, you know, thrown near them, kind of thing. When in actuality, it's likely just them showing their presence, saying, "Hey, we're here," you know, kind of thing. Uh, there's a lot of fear surrounding this this subject, uh, um, this species, and uh, which I can understand. But I, I've uh, I've put myself through that fear and and spent spent that time and 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 put my life at risk basically you know when i first went into that tent i had no idea what i was dealing with and i had thoughts of am i going to get a giant rock or a tree dropped on my tent you know thank god never happened and since then they have shown me nothing but compassion and, and a loving approach and i believe this whole situation was given to me to you know speak openly about them you know about what's really going on who they are and and this is what they want they they want us to wake up they are reaching out to humanity and and this is uh i believe what this situation was about you know to to really kind of flip this subject upside down and just open it up and and since that situation the the aspect of their their abilities the whole interdimensional aspect has really blown wide open because it wasn't it wasn't spoken of, you know, or it was cl behind closed doors uh, before Nefetia. And since then, it's really, you know, things have really changed with this subject. So it's nice to see that, you know, people are slowly catching on, even though there's still, you know, there's a lot of denial and um, ridicule factors and all that because, you know, people are having their, their belief system challenge kind of thing, right? Nobody likes that, but uh, we're slowly getting there. Well, I'm really glad that you're playing a key role in this, and Sasquatch could not have found a better person to do this critically important work in this time, most of all. Now, there have been reports over the years from quite credible people that Sasquatch has been able to communicate with individuals telepathically. Have, have you ever experienced that, or have you heard similar accounts from others? Oh, I've definitely had uh, some of those instances. I've I've had uh, telepathy. I've had physical contact. Um, I've I've had uh, I've had objects dropped right into my hands. I've had uh, photos imposed on my camera. Dozens of photos imposed on um, some of them on my camera while the camera's sitting on a table inside the cottage within arm's reach, and I keep checking it, and uh, pictures would appear. There, there's all kinds of strangeness that come with these guys, uh, l strange light phenomena. Uh, as far as the telepathy goes, so the first incident I ever had was, uh, I was, I can't remember the date on this, but, you know, we were in the thick of things. And I was at home, was kind of uh, almost asleep on the couch when they gave me a grunt in my head that was so loud it just, it shot me to my feet and I was instantly on the phone to the cottage guy telling them what just happened. So that really blew my mind. And it's just like a big, just a big guttural grunt, you know. Here where I live now, uh, I've heard uh, a couple of grunts come out of the living room earlier uh, this summer. Windows were closed, nobody's home. And they weren't loud, but they reverberated through the house. I, could, I actually could feel them. There's, uh, I had an incident where I was sitting at my computer one day. I was on a break from work. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I was, you know, I, I lived close, so I, you know, I stopped off at home, and I'm sitting on the computer, and uh, and I was feeling kind of, you know, a little down that day. So I, 
while I was driving to work, I, you know, just kind of spoke out loud and, and asked for some sign kind of thing, right? And so I'm sitting there on the computer, and I hear Nefetia call my name in my head. It was kind of distant, so this, it was, it was uh, definitely there. It was, it was loud and clear, but it was more distant sounding than this, than that first grunt. And instantly, he started, uh, excuse me, started uh, banging on the in my apartment. So getting, uh, I'd been in this place for about eight years at that time and never heard these bangs before. And it was just like bang, 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 bang. You know, uh, half a dozen of them. I, I didn't count. Um, but the timing was impe impeccable. It was immediate. Uh, you know, right after hearing the voice in the head, there was another incident while I'm in the tent and, and, I, and I heard, uh, I crawled in my tent and I heard a voice, what I thought was just outside the tent wall. But I had a recorder outside. And it, you know, that thing was pretty sensitive, and it should have picked it up, and there was nothing there. So, yeah, there's definitely been some instances, and they also have an ability to come to you in your dreams and communicate that way. And this has happened to me uh, quite a few times, and I've met a couple of their family members this way. The the big guy uh, stands between 11 and 12 feet tall. I shook his. Well, I went to shake his hand, but it ended up being his finger because his hand was so huge. Uh, they, <laughs> they brought one of their children to me this way. Again, I was sleeping on the couch at home, and I was laying on my side facing the back of the couch. This, I think, was about, I don't know, it was around 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe kind of. It was, it was really late. And in this dream, I'm exactly as I am on the couch, and I could sense a, an older female... And there was a, she brought a, a I, I think he was a, a little guy, a little little male, and he was probably about the size of a two-year-old. And I reached my arm up, and he put his hand in mine, so I got to hold his hand, and I got to feel all his energy, all his feelings, everything he was feeling, and it was absolutely incredible. It was one of the most incredible experiences of, uh, you know, my uh, contact with them. And I was conscious enough in that dream state to, uh, you know, kind of flinch my hand a little bit to get a reaction out of him on purpose. And I didn't do it a lot, you know, hard or anything, just, just a little bit, you know, just, and he didn't pull away. And I felt this wave of, uh, of energy, just, it was just incredible. And it went right through my body and, and he was so excited and so freaked out at the same time. But he didn't pull away, and, and he was like just mind blown that he's holding hands with this human, and you know, and vice versa, right? But just being able to feel exactly what they feel was just incredible. And then I and then I woke up, and I and I always tend to do that too. As soon as it's over, I wake up right away, and I you know I, I reached my hand up uh, looking for more, but uh, you know the, it was over, right? That incident was over. There's been things happen here where I'm living now. With uh, There's been a visual here. There's been physical contact here. Um, footprints left. Uh, vocalizations in the house, like I mentioned. Um, the last one happened right after I come back from the, the Sasquatch Summit in, in Washington there in November. It was the, the next morning. I, I got a cat, and I, there's been a couple of cat meow um, vocals that weren't him. This one was... Uh, you know, when two cats get together and they're pissed off, ready to fight, it was kind of one of those sounds. And my cat, he never does that, right? This happened right at my bedroom door. Kind of, you know, shot my eyes wide open. I had just woken up, too. So that was uh, that was the last incident that happened here, which was, uh, I guess, a few weeks ago. Um, oh, and I just want to mention, too, uh, the Sasquatch Summit in Washington at Grays Harbor for 2017, which is mid-November. I'll be uh, doing my first presentation there. So I will be speaking there next year. If it's okay, we'll go over this first hour by just a couple of minutes because this has been a, an, an amazing experience for me. It's been a heartwarming experience. The experience you just described in a spiritual encounter with that young male was just just really moving to me. Now, doing some of these dream experiences, and that's exactly how a spiritually evolved civilization would interact with people like us. They would come to us in our dreams where they don't seem as frightening to us and we could be kind of in a higher elevated state ourselves. Did they ever give you a glimpse in these 
uh, mystical experiences of the other dimensions and the other realms that they inhabit or you know go to once in a while. You know, um, James, I've I've never offhand, uh, you know, nothing really sticks out where where they've taken me anywhere or it's most of those incidents have been meeting them and they always uh, the other kind of strange thing is they tend to cover their face they don't want me to see their face for some reason you know they hide their features or or uh, if i do see them it's wiped from my mind but as uh, as far as seeing any of the other dimensional you know dimensions going on uh, around us um there's nothing really that uh with any clarity that sticks out, not, not at this time. Well, we've reached the end of the first hour, and we're just getting started. You've been listening to our very special guest, Mike Patterson of Sasquatch, Ontario, uh, the YouTube channel, uh, explain to us his interactions with Sasquatch. Mike, how would the listeners get a hold of you? Well, you can contact me through uh, Sasquatch Ontario on on YouTube. It's the channel that has about sixty videos on there right now. There there is a couple channels because I I had some issues with it going up and down and you know and I'd started another one but uh, that's been dealt with. So um, Sasquatch Ontario on YouTube or you can reach me on Facebook as well under under Mike Patterson. It's one T. Um, there is two accounts on that as well. It's not the one with the hand in the snow. That that's a suspended account. So if anybody wants to contact me, it's uh, you know through the other one. Uh, yeah. So Facebook uh, and and YouTube. Basically, that's it at this point. You've been listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. If you believe in what we do, if you like what we do, please go to our website, thecosmicswitchboard.com. Sign up and become a member. And we will see you at the top of the next hour. I miss you, my friend. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh.